Okay. I think we'll get started with the introduction. Okay. Yeah, welcome everyone to this History Workshop webinar. Um, I'm Kaswande, I'll be chairing today. I'm a PhD student in the History Workshop. Um, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Laura Efron, um, who will be speaking on Southern experiences in dialogue, a case study on South Atlantic knowledge production. <clears throat> Dr. Lara Efron completed, uh, just give me a second. Okay. Dr. Lara Efron completed her BA degree in history and her MA in contemporary history in Argentina. Uh, she got her PhD in African studies at UCT in 2020. And she is currently a postdoc fellow at Univers University of Buenos Aires. Uh, Conisset. She worked as an assistant professor in African history and as a high school history teacher in Argentina in the past. Um, so the basic format is that uh, Dr. Efron is going to talk for about 20 minutes and uh, we'll open it up for discussion and questions afterwards. Uh, please participate. And uh, while Dr. Efron is talking, you, you can put in some questions in the chat and, and, and we'll monitor that. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Efron, please. Thank you so much, Kasson. I would say good morning to everyone <laughs> from this side of the world. Um, I'm really happy to be here. And it's, in fact, for me, it's really important because it's the first time I'm going to be talking about my research uh, in, uh, in South Africa, even though I'm in Argentina, um, which is really important and, and meaningful also because if not, how am I going to know what people think and how am I going to know the things that I didn't get to know at the time? Uh, I hope this is just the first time. Uh, and that I'm going to be able to keep discussing this with many, many more people and many more trips to South Africa, hopefully. So I've been in South Africa many times uh, before uh, the PhD as part of my previous research. And one of the things that I've noticed while I was there is that people would talk to me for in different situations. It would be like a more uh, academic situation. It could be like a friendly situation. But every time I spoke with people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, they would mention something about Latin America. And uh, it would be writers, literature, history, the Cuban alphabetization project, uh, the Chilean uh, Allende's uh, uh, government. So suddenly I began to think, OK, there's a generation in South Africa that knows a lot about Latin America. How was that possible? But that stayed in my brain and I continue my life. But I'm going to be very honest. And then I thought I was going to do my PhD on something else. Uh, I've been working on, on the Teachers League of South Africa for a long time. And then I was like, oh, I'm going to continue with this. And then I thought, no, I want to do something that is meaningful for me as well. Being an Argentinian going to South Africa, I was also trying to promote those links of discussions about the South, from the South, and for the South. And in that sense, I thought, okay, what can I do that is meaningful for, from a historical approach? So I've been reading a lot about uh, epistemological discussions, decolonial theory, theories, post-colonial theories, and how knowledge is produced. And, uh, I've been reading a lot about how the South is a new space of production. We know all these discussions. Many of you might know them or heard about them. And suddenly I thought there should be a case. There should be an example that bring clarity to all these theoretical discussions. So me as a historian, try to engage with, with a theoretical discussion that I wasn't that comfortable with, I have to be honest. I, my, my supervisor was like, Laura, you should get more theoretical. I was like, I need the documents. I need the sources. And uh, in that regard, I, the aim of this research was to use one case that could help us to see those discussions, that could help us to see how 
The South is a space of exchanges, it's a space of dialogue, and it has its own history. I wanted to do a research that also was a transnational history, not to be doing research only on South Africa or only on Latin America or only in Argentina, knowing that that's kind of like a tendency in the academic world. Um, but, but with one case, it's never enough. And I know that this is just one step. And it was me trying to, to, to put more info into the debate. Um, so saying that, the main aim was to uh, check and to analyze a case in which Latin American ideas were circulating in South Africa. How were they circulating? What did they mean? How did people understood them? And what did they do with them? And that's, that was mainly the, the general idea but to do so and to get a case, I, I began to do research. And I went talking with a lot of people, with activists, with uh, uh, scholars, even with like just all people that were educated in that, in that time, in the 70s and 80s. And I realized that in fact, there was a lot of organizations that were using Latin American history or pedagogies or even theoretical backgrounds to, to teach during the 70s and 80s. I want to share, before I forget, I want to share my presentation. Um, I can share, ne? yes. Because I want you to be able to see some of the material now. I don't know if you can see, ah, let me put it on presentation. Is it, is it okay? Yes, yes. Yeah, we can see. Okay. Uh, so the first thing that I asked myself was, was, okay, how come ideas and books and photocopies and videotapes and recordings from Latin American, uh, either revolutionaries or leaders or history were circulating in the context of the apartheid? Coming from Argentina, and I have to admit that there was an important part of me involved in this because I was trying to be honest with the way I was researching and to see that in fact, my positionality was also part of how I was checking, how I was seeing through the case. So I thought, okay, me coming from Argentina, from our personal experience of a dictator regime in the seventies that was super violent and that in fact ideas were chased by the state, I expected to find many, many items banned I expected to find uh, the, apart the apartheid government system of control much more involved in uh, all these like small, small uh, items, let's say, uh, books and, uh, and even videos that were circulating. But, and that's why I went to, to the research, to, uh, to do research on, on, on the archives. And I was surprised. I expected much more than, I, than what I found. Yes, what did I find? Fidel's uh, Castro's books, uh, Che Guevara's books, books that had, it was obvious, for example, uh, towards the revolution in Chile, yes. But all these other material that were kind of like, we could even think history, the history of Latin America wasn't banned. I was surprised because I expected much more. And I thought, okay, does that mean that there, was, there wasn't enough circulation? If things were not banned, what does it mean? Does it mean that there was no circulation? Or that in fact, it was possible to, 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 to read these things legally? And I'm using quotation marks because we know that legal or illegal, it's not only about if it was censored in, in a document. And I found in my first, a year of research, four channels of arrival and circulations of uh, books, yeah, mainly, which is the church, basically because of the 
theology of liberation and how many priests in, uh, in South Africa were linked to priests in, uh, in South America and they would travel to South America, particularly to get uh, more uh, information about the theology of liberation and discuss uh, that ideology, for example, in Peru. And, that, and that's how, for example, uh, Freire's, book, uh, Freire's books arrived to, to South Africa uh, through the church. Then the other way that those who lived in dictatorship regimes or even during the apartheid probably know, because I think it's, it was part of like the everyday life somehow for some of us, for some of you, <laughs> is the luggage. A lot of people would travel to the UK, for example, and uh, bring books and, uh, or even buy them and get them sent with the courier. And the, it's interesting because uh, by doing some interviews on this, I realized that many times books were stopped and uh, there was a control and, and, and people had to explain why they, they brought them. And there's always this excuse about uh, research or uh, the university or academic, blah, blah, blah. And that sometimes would work as an excuse. Or for example, in, in some cases it was material that was needed to write uh, books against the communist uh, spread in Latin America. So there's, there were possibilities in terms of how to justify getting those books in the luggage. Then I realized that because the, uh, the banning of books in South Africa became more strict in the 60s, some books were there already. And uh, by talking with many librarians, uh, not only librarians from uh, public libraries, but also from small libraries in, 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 in the, the neighborhoods, in the residency areas, or uh, even at university, that libraries had the chance to decide, or librarians had the chance to decide, even if they were instructed to take the books out, they had a choice. And for me, that's interesting for the everyday decisions of people under a control and oppressive system. They had a choice. And uh, in some cases, there are underground libraries that had Latin American books circulating. In some cases, uh, there were public uh, libraries that had books change their covers so that people could still check them out. And even at universities, for example, I, 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 I was very lucky to be able to be part of a a set of interviews with the previous librarians in, in, at the University of UCT, at UCT, and uh, they were doing a research on uh, kind of like an archaeology of, 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 uh, of the banning and, and how did that work at university. And while there were some people probably infiltrated controlling, because it's known that some, there were some members of the library, librarians that were controlling who asked for the books, Many librarians also decided not to uh, take notes of who was consulting the books, which means that the library didn't didn't uh, throw the, the the books, didn't burn the books, which is what I mean from a Latin American perspective. I, I think that for South Af for you South Africans, you have to now do the exercise of think like I was thinking, <laughs> coming from my background. I expected those books to disappear, to be buried. No. They were kept in a specific room, separated, and, you, and people needed to ask for permission. So there's still this kind of like gray zone in which it's not legal, but it is. Because you could consult a book for a research. You could consult a book because your, your professor allowed you to, because it was part of the, of, of the course. So I was interested in that, in how suddenly what I expected to be banned, it wasn't. But, and it was kind of like legal to use it. And then the university was also a space because departments, it's interesting because even in the 80s, many departments had uh, courses on Latin American economy, Latin American sociology, labor in Latin America, history of Latin America. And uh, although the bibliography was quite academic, it was super revolutionary. They were reading on uh, Peronism and uh, populist governments in South America, they were reading about peasant organizations in Peru. Yes, it didn't say, the title didn't say the revolution in Peru or the revolution, no. But 
by reading that people got to know the deepness and complexities of those processes in, in the continent. So once I realized that things were circulating and that, that I could prove it by talking with people, and that's the thing, uh, this, in this, this part of the research is based on interviews. I don't have, uh, yes, I have the Jacobson code and I, well, by now, I don't know if I will, I will have access anymore to books that were in the libraries because for example, in the Jagger library, they had a, a system of coding of books that they were banned. And uh, we were looking into that, um, the coding of in the library. But then I thought, okay, this kind of circulation is not probably ma massive. It's not for everyone. How did everyone get to know? And I realized that many organizations that were in the, in, in the society were producing their own educational material. And that's how I ended up knowing about ILRI. I, I got to know about ILRI just because doing research, I found a booklet. And the booklet was the Bolivia booklet. It's a booklet that you, I'm gonna show now. But when I saw it, again, I was super surprised. I was like, these guys were talking about Bolivia in the 80s, wow. <laughs> Wow, why am I saying like this? Because in fact, from this side of the world, Bolivia was also in South Africa, but not in the 80s, in the 2000s. And uh, that's when, uh, for me, present and past began to be entangled because at some point I couldn't think, I couldn't think about the past without thinking about the present and how in fact these dialogues that we are having nowadays had their roots in the past. So, why ILRIG and not another organization? I managed to get info about many others. I wanted to work, uh, I wanted to work with SACET, for example. Um, but particularly ILRIG for me was a big opportunity. First of all, because I managed to get archival material in the public archives uh, and even at ILRIGs. Secondly, because I met Linda Cooper, David Cooper, and David Fig, and they wanted to talk with me, which is not easy to, to create that type of relationship. It's not easy to find people that will talk with someone that is not from the same country. Sometimes it's better, sometimes we know as historians, we know that it's like the, a double-sided situation. Being a foreigner can, could, could, could help out, but sometimes it doesn't. Uh, and uh, I found that they were keen to talk about the past and that they, in fact, somehow needed to talk about the past. And it wasn't only their, their kindness with their words and their memories, but it was also their kindness sharing their own personal archives, which was so rich, full of their personal notes and uh, course lines like, with all the uh, like corrections on the margins. And that's like archival, it's like gold. Um, and uh, so I thought, okay, I could do many cases and go through them in a more general approach, or I could do like one case and get deep into it. And I thought I have a lot of material. And it wasn't only because of that. Also, Ilrik was an organization that uh, was built, uh, was created in 1982, and uh, that had really an impact in, uh, in the trade unions. Uh, their material, their publications were circulating like widely, and, uh, and it's still alive. It's an organization that it's still running in South Africa. So I thought it was meaningful also to, to see the origins of Ilrik and to try to revalue that experience because it, I think it was a big effort also to, to make people understand Latin American history in that context. Uh, and it took a lot of work. Um, for those that I don't know if everyone knows, I sometimes I tend to think that people know, ILRIG uh, uh, is the International Labor Research and Information Group that was created in 1982. Uh, but it was created as a extension program from the sociology department at UCT. And I also found that very interesting because being a, an extension program allowed ILRIC to be part of the university, but at the same time, not to. 
it gave them some independence, but at the same time, university was there as a space, as a structure, as a, as a it gave them the, the legitimation to be doing what they were doing. And because it was a group that began doing research, they were allowed to consult books. They were allowed to import and to buy things from abroad. They were allowed, because it was part of academic research, to be talking about these kind of things. That doesn't mean that they didn't have issues later on with the government and that they had to even get their lawyers to, to, to get involved when, when some of their booklets were, were being banned. Or they tried to ban them and they were, they were able not to get banned. So for example, for you also to see how the impact of this, of, of, of their publications uh, was around, like was spreading around the, the, the trade unions. For example, between 1983 and 1987, it's four years, 50,000 booklets were sold. I think, and, uh, and in this picture, I don't know if you can see it, in this picture, uh, it's a picture that uh, the story behind it is really interesting. I, I was interviewing David Figg in his house and uh, he was like, Laura, I want to show you something. He went to a museum and he found this picture. He was walking in a museum and he found a picture of a, a massive protest for the Google Letter 7. And, uh, and he, sorry, in, in Zoom, it's not the same. If we could probably see it in a big screen, you probably would see better. And you can see that many of the protesters have Ilric booklets in their hands and they are raising it like this. It could be that they just came out of a meeting and they got the booklet. It could be that it was a random thing, but it doesn't matter why and how, but for me, it was an example of how even it, they didn't mean to use the booklet to protest in itself. There's something happening there. They could have chosen something else, but they chose to raise that. So in that sense, I thought Ilrig need to be studied. Uh, and uh, again, the kindness of the people that I that I've been in touch with was so, so big that I also felt the responsibility to, to, to show this history. Of course, there's more to be said. Of course, this is just a PhD. We all know that I want to keep going, but I had to stop at some point and come back home. <laughs> um, so if we see now, let's get into the case. Uh, how am I doing with time? I have a bit, I, at uh, least I... Yeah. One example. You have about five minutes, I think. <gasps> okay, <laughs> I'm gonna try to, to, to go fast. So I said that the research was about the circulation of ideas and that in fact, in that circulation of ideas, there was also knowledge produced in the, produced in the South. And that was the main aim, to show an example in which knowledge has been circulating, discussed and produced. Why did I choose this? Because Ilrik was, publishing material on uh, Latin American history, the history of revolution, the history of labor movements. And uh, by doing that, they had to explain that history to the regular public. So their, their booklets are quite pedagogical, educational, and uh, it's, it's, it invites someone that doesn't know anything on history to read and to be interested in it. And uh, they took a long, long time for each of the booklets to, to tell small stories, to tell biographies, to engage with the, with the workers and uh, the drawings. And th there was a team working and thinking how to explain these histories to the general public. And in that, I believe that there was a process of translation. And the translation is not only a translation in terms of language, which Ilrik did, Ilrik did translate sometimes from Spanish to English, sometimes from Portuguese to English. Mostly they did the translation on like the local languages, uh, which is really interesting because at that time, I think that was quite, uh, quite new. 
But also there was a translation in that pedagogical approach. There was a translation in terms of epistemology. And that's where I want to put the focus on and see, okay, there was really an effort to make Latin American ideas, histories, systems of operations, values, understandable for the regular public in South Africa. And that meant translating it, translating it to make it easy to understand for someone that doesn't know what it means, that didn't live, that didn't have that experience. So how do we make two societies with different values, with different experiences, with different uh, traditions and beliefs understand each other? We know that for many years or centuries, that wasn't the case. Translation was a way to be oppressive. Translation was related with oppression, with colonization. And I feel that in this moment, in the 70s and 80s, from Latin America, reading to the South African and African cases and even Indian, the, the liberation movements, and from South Africa, reading the cases on Latin America, there is an attempt to create a more horizontal link between two different realities, two different imaginaries. And that's, for me, that was an example on this attempt to create a more democratic relationship with, between different epistemological systems. So what I saw in Ilrig is that in fact, uh, by explaining Latin American ideas, they were trying to teach, but it was also based or moved by a political aim because understanding Latin America was also a tool or was, it was helpful to understand the local society and to bring more input into the discussions on how are we gonna get out of this? How are we gonna fight the system? How, how are we gonna build a new South Africa? All those debates were also based by on these kind of discussions on other cases from the past. So I believe that in that re this redefining and resignifying concepts and ideas from Latin America, they were promoting the creation of new ideas in South Africa. How did I do this? Because until now I was talking from the beginning, we need a case, we need to show evidence. I spoke a lot and I didn't show the evidence. Eh? <laughs> so because I don't have much time, I want to show one case. I, I did research on, on all the booklets and uh, I, in, you can read in the thesis, but at least with one, one case, it will show an example. This is the Bolivia booklet uh, that was uh, published in 1985. And when I spoke with, uh, with David Cooper, that was the, the, the responsible of, of the booklet, which doesn't mean that he wrote it on his own. They used to write all together. There was a team engaged in research and writing. We discussed about it and he was like, look, Bolivia had a very similar reality to the South African one. It was a country that was mostly rural, uh, mostly peasants, but it also had these spots of industrial development with mining. It was also similar to South Africa because most of the population was indigenous and they had a settler community that took over and domain for a long time. And it was also a third world country. So for at least for him, that was enough to find similarities that would make it easy to explain the revolution uh, for the South African public and also to open new questions. So in the, the, the booklet explains Bolivia's society, Bolivia's history in a more general way. And then it goes into the revolution of 1952. And the booklet understands the revolution of 1952 as a revolution that was made by the people. And it was a people's government based on an alliance of the people. And for me, that was quite complete. When I read it, I was like, this is a problem. And that's because I am coming from this side of the world that I saw it like that. Um, first of all, the concept of the people in itself in the South African 80s context had many other meanings. Uh, talking about the people could be talking about the people in the 80s, even though the booklet is from, is talking about 1952. But I could see that there were like, 
current discussions on the South African context that were involved in, in, in trying to analyze Bolivia. The booklet shows, I, I just uh, put few, a few pictures. Uh, this, the first picture uh, is uh, the introduction and uh, it says in 1952, big changes happened in Bolivia, a small country in South America. Ordinary workers, peasants, educated people and owners of small businesses got rid of the army government and the owners of the big mine, the big mines. They formed a new people's government. Throughout the booklet, the concept of the people uh, is, is mentioned constantly. Now, the thing is from the Latin American perspective and even from the, from the Bolivian perspective, the revolution of 1952 wasn't a people's revolution. It was a national, nationalist revolution. But now I understand that talking about the nationalist revolution in the South African context will mean something else. <laughs> That's when concepts begin to be complicated because the same concept has different definitions based on historical experiences. So what I found is that IRIC members try to translate what happened in Bolivia based on the South African reality. The same happens when they talk about the alliance of the people. Instead of an alliance of the people, it was a middle class movement that got engaged with the working class, but it was a middle class leading uh, movement with middle class uh, aims. So for me, by going through the booklet and reading concepts that they repeat and then they try to explain the, the Bolivian reality that it's, they are not really accurate in the sense of like, that's not how we would explain this side of the world. I realized that in fact, that was the translation process in which some concepts don't mean that they don't mean the same in South Africa, and they are in fact problematic in South Africa. And uh, and by using another concepts, it was a way to make it easier for people to understand. But those concepts have their own history and their own meanings in South Africa, and that's when it becomes political. That's when uh, politics and uh, the current situation of the eighties gets involved in, in in these booklets that are talking about the past. So based on just this is one example, there are examples on, uh, on the mining process, the labor and the gender and race and racial categories. I understand that this was a big effort to make it easy for people to understand Latin America and uh, probably it did work well because it made it uh, easy to, to read. But for me, it's more than that. It's about the attempt and the effort that Ilrik put into translate realities. And that's when it becomes an example of this Southern epistemological exchange. So yes, I am gonna stop right now <laughs> because I've been talking a lot. Uh, wow, thank you so much, Dr. Efren, very fascinating. Um, and this, I think, will be a very impactful study on South-South, uh, as you call it, epistemological transfers. Um, one thing I found interesting, without preempting other people's questions, is uh, the case you described in, 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 in your thesis of uh, David Fig being approached by uh, theater practitioners from the township to, to get uh, a Che Guevara's story and, and to, to perform it and how he navigated the system to bring those books in. Um, but we can talk about that later. I just wanna see if people have questions. Um, give people, please come, come on to, you can raise your hand. Or, or chat. Um, but while we wait for questions, yeah, I think Dr. Efren, would you like to just comment more on this idea of theater in the 80s? Was this more widespread in terms of Latin American ideas finding it into finding themselves in 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 um, township theater? And before you answer that, I think there's there's one question there's one hand so i'll i'll let uh, natalia uh, please you can turn on your mic 
Thank you so much, Kasonde. I don't have a particular question, Laura. First, I would like to congrats for the research and the presentation, but I wanted to share with all of you. I'm sorry, I, I'm not, I'm gonna try to put the camera, but yeah, I live in a rural area, so the, the internet is not uh, the best. <laughs> um, and I wanted to share with all of you um, the experience also of bringing this material that I come to know for, uh, from Laura. I teach African history here in Northeast uh, of Brazil to bring some of these uh, booklets to my students here in Brazil, because uh, we have a university that has these South-South agreements with African countries of, uh, uh, of official language, Portuguese, Portuguese official language, and um, to historize the South-South exchanges uh, that can much before a government and much before academic uh, research comes through activism, and also to share about, for example, the publications in Latin America that Laura must uh, know uh, very well for sure, um, that were sold in the newspaper, uh, how do you call the newspaper, where, where this is small shops that sell newspaper. They also sold these publications, uh, uh, how do you say, to, um, for example, they come with the world process of independence of Congo and a poster of Lumumba uh, from Sepal, for example. Marie, mm -hmm. Marisa must know, we know them yes. also. Or, um, or interviews to, uh, to Mau Mau fighters, the, the guerrilla from Kenya in, in Spanish. No? in the 70s or in the 60s or in the 50s uh, to a diversity of um, materials that were circulating and that is impressive and all the research of Laura connects a lot with my experience I did research on women activists however because I'm Argentinian also because I study in Brazil um, for example I found in the former Athlon College in the Cape Flats someone uh, singing to me Victor Jara from Chile, a revolutionary song from Chile. Uh, someone uh, talking to me by heart uh, the, the poems of Neruda, also a Chilean revolutionary poet. Someone telling me Cortázar was the favorite writer and, and a lot, a lot, a lot of experience that I was like, yeah, in, in highly segregated neighborhoods, um teachers uh like maybe in the ancient time in during apartheid classifies as color or asians that has this connection uh with latin american war and specifically with the 70s revolutionary culture very deep uh because this is exactly the authors or the music that we listen at home <laughs> that my parents listen at home no? so this deep connection uh it always make me, how to say, emotional, to be honest with, because this is the music I was raised with and I could have never uh, imagined uh, I would have find um, in, in first interaction, many people would bring it to me, would tell me uh, in South Africa, in Cape Flats specifically, not in South Africa in general, um, would bring these references. So that's all what I wanted to share about um, also the impact of, uh, of showing this kind of uh, material um, in the classes, in the African histories classes here in Latin America is very meaningful. The booklet I, I had, uh, influenced by Laura, obviously, <laughs> was the booklet of Brazil. And mm. they were already pointing Lula trajectory who come to yes. be the president of Brazil. Yes. And it's very accurate. It's very yes. accurate. Uh, so it's very impressive. And also my students get like, wow, um, yes. to know about this connection. So thank you. Don't want to steal more time. Uh, I'm reading. Sorry. Okay, I'm reading there. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm going to. Yeah, read. sorry. Um... Yeah, uh, so Dr. Suriano, I think, has a question. Um, oh, there are a couple of questions in, 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 in the chat. Um, 
The first one is, uh, thanks, Lara. I really enjoyed the paper. Really important contribution to transnational history, I think. You seem to be suggesting that the process of translation was shaped by shared ideological reference points. But would contemporary Bolivian readers have recognized the story of their own political struggle in mm. the Ilrig pamphlet? Ah. And then uh, we'll just read Dr. Siriano's, then yes. you can respond to, to yes. both. Um, very interesting, Lara. In your interviews, did you pick up more about circulation? The picture shows people holding booklets. And you said between 83 and 87, 50,000 booklets were sold. Were these booklets also read um, and discussed in reading yes. groups or similar spaces? Okay, so you've got a few a few questions there. Um, wow, uh, the first one, uh, Rob, is uh, it's difficult. I cannot put myself in in a Bolivian person. I I, I mean, I I will answer as myself. That's what I'm saying, which is not what probably someone from Bolivia in the, in the 80s would say. And uh, I can do that exercise, but what I'm trying to say is I'm not the one that can answer exactly that. Um, I, I believe that there is, you see, the thing is the booklets are based, they have like a, a Marxist approach, you could say, and, most, and it really had a Marxist approach to reality and uh, with all the dis distinctions and inner discussions and et cetera, et cetera, that we all know that happens among Marxist theory. Um, and the, the way they read Bolivia was based on a Marxist uh, perspective. In that regard, we could even say, okay, is that South, South or not? That was one of my questions. What happens when Marxism gets involved? Um, I didn't answer it in my PhD, to be honest, uh, because it's quite a difficult one. We do know that those theories were also uh, adopted and uh, transformed in local societies. Eh? Marxism in the South is not the same. Um, I think that the booklet is quite accurate. Uh, Natalia was saying about the Brazilian one as well. The, in terms of history, it is quite accurate and the analysis is quite accurate, but there are some specific situations and concepts that make it, that if a Bolivian person would read that the government was a people's government, they would be like, no, that this was a people's uh, revolution, no. But that's because of the process of changing the concepts that they are using to make it adjustable to the reality of South Africa. You know, Because if you say in South Africa that this was a nationalist revolution, what would that mean? For a South African public, in the 80s or even now, if you say this is a nationalist revolution, what do South Africans understand out of that? You see, and, and that's when it becomes, choosing the concepts becomes important to make it easy or to make it, uh, I don't know how to say it, like, uh, because I keep repeating, I keep repeating myself, eh? I, I'm gonna criticize myself. I keep repeating the idea of that, making it uh, understandable. I don't know if that's the main way of saying it. Um, it's kind of like, a, it's a, in terms of like a comparison, eh? when we are comparing two different things, at some point you need a basic field. And I think that this transformation of concepts is related with that. Um, so yes, in terms of the general approach to the history, it is accurate, but these concepts that are defining the processes we should translate them again <laughs> to go back to the public in Bolivia. Then I have Maria, Maria's question. Yes, uh, I don't know if everyone can read it. Uh, yes, I'll just repeat it. Uh, so uh, uh, Maria Siriano, Dr. Siriano writes in, in her question, in your interviews, did you pick up more about circulation, uh, so circulation of the texts once they had been published by Ilrig. Uh, the, the very fascinating picture shows people holding the booklets, and you said that between 1983 and 1987, 50,000 booklets were sold. So after they were sold, were these booklets also read and discussed in reading 
uh, spaces. And this also, I think, relates to my question of, yeah. uh, you know, where did they permeate other media, like, you know, community theater, uh, opposition theater? Yes, well, yeah. I can answer these to a certain extent, to a certain extent, uh, but I know that probably there's more. Yeah, but as it wasn't the focus of my research, how did people read it? Uh, I cannot answer that. Uh, but I do, I, I, by doing interviews uh, with, the, with ILRIG members and also by reading all the reports, uh, if you go through all the, the reports of the organization, they had to do reports every two or three years because they were getting some funding, uh, not only from university, but from abroad. And they had to explain what they were doing. Um, the organization managed to do seminars in regular basis, uh, most of the times for trade unions, uh, sometimes for students, also for university students. Um, and it was kind of like on demand. Uh, and sometimes even what they were researching and writing was based on demand. So for example, Ilrik published a booklet on the revolution in Nicaragua, and that wasn't part of the series because particularly one trade union was asking for information on that. So there were seminars in Johannesburg, in Cape Town, uh, all around in the, in the cities mostly. Um, seminars with uh, the leaders of the trade union, sometimes with also with the uh, general workers. There were also uh, material that they would uh, uh, share with the organizations, for example, they had uh, recordings, they would make these videotapes explaining what, and they would go like with the booklet. So the booklet and the videotapes would go together in case uh, they would use it without someone from ILRIG being there present. So this was used not only by ILRIG running seminars, but also for other types of seminars and, uh, and organizations, uh, as you call it in the grassroots, uh, that would also use it on their own. Um, and there are a lot, uh, the, the list is super, super long. Uh, and uh, regarding what you were saying, Kasonde, in terms of uh, theater, you know, I, there's someone that would probably answer better, much better, many persons probably, not only one. Um, there was a member at ILRIG that uh, he, in fact, was the one that was more engaged with the with the general public, and uh, that he was the one translating uh, the booklets into into Cosa, uh, Dinga, es Cueva, and um, he would know better. But I do know that these these booklets. Imagine this: if you if you get the booklet, a man. With the family gets the booklet in his and he takes it home and then uh, i'm thinking about the this circulation of, okay the, the booklet was circulating in in the in the neighborhood you know in the township as well because people had them so yes they got in they got them in a seminar in the trade union in the in the trade union seminar but then that was circulating as well so probably it was part of like i don't know if the theater groups were reading it reading the booklets, but they were reading Latin America because also there was an approach to theater and to resistance through through art. So mm. yeah. thank you. I think uh, Laura has a question. Uh. Uh, thanks. Uh, this is so fascinating and I've got about 100 questions, but I'll just ask <laughs> one or two for now. Um, so so clearly a lot of people are reading this material, are thinking about uh, how revolutionary and liberation struggles are playing out in Latin America. Do you have a sense then um, to what degree, uh, once these ideas are circulating, how they are then shaping South Africans' uh, strategies for how they are thinking about the South African struggle or how they're conceptualizing the South African struggle? Um, yeah, so that's my first question. And if I can ask another question, which I know isn't actually uh, what, what you're looking at, but um, I've seen in my own work, and uh, there's lots of other or some other writing about this, that not only were there left wing uh, links between uh, yes. Latin America and South Africa, but very violent right wing links as well. Could you say yes. something about those and how those ideas and practices of torture and whatever else might also be circulating? Yeah. 
<laughs> Look, you know, uh, when, when I was uh, doing my PhD in South Africa, uh, in Cape Town, someone contacted me because they were doing research on, uh, I'm, this is a, it's just an anecdote, but to show how the links go so, so far in time, um, because it was the 200th anniversary of our independence. Uh, that was 2010. And then I was traveling, coming along, and someone asked me, no, I don't know exactly the date when they asked me, but it was about that. It was about the 200 years. And uh, they asked me if I could do some research on uh, the ships that came to Buenos Aires, uh, because the English tried to conquer Buenos Aires in 1807. And the ships that came to, to conquer Buenos Aires, and they couldn't, uh, were coming from Cape Town. Yes, this is just a a small thing that doesn't come into this discussion, but why am I bringing this? Because what I'm trying to say is the relationship between our continents has been shaped even by colonialism. And, and in that sense, we cannot, uh, it, like it's deeper than we think or that we know. And uh, as you are saying, like even the, the right wing was having their own uh, exchanges. Um, there are people in this in this seminar right now present that they know more than me uh, that I know. They, Marisa, Selena, they they might know better than me about that. But we do know that, um, and they could correct me eh? because that's not my my field. Uh, um, I know Selena knows better uh, probably. Selena, if you want to say it, um, that uh, in fact when they were trying to do research on how the money. Uh, was running uh, out of this country, like the links between the, the 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 right wing, let's say, and the people that were part of the of the dictatorship regimes. They were trying to see how the money was running, and uh, they found that people were hiding in South Africa. Some some families were hiding in South Africa, and uh, and they could trace it even with the money. I'm not sure. I'm talking, but I know that some people in this room know better than me, and they could open the mic and and, and correct me. Um, but yes, the links with the with the right wing also took place, and uh, it makes sense if we think about it in the context of the Cold War, in the context of neoliberalism, and and how the right wing uh, was so linked even with the U.S. somehow. Um, but uh, I don't know if anyone wants. I'm trying to get them to speak, but they are not speaking. <laughs> we do have a couple of questions, Laura. Um, Galaxy tab. I don't know who that is. Um, there's Sorry. a question in the. Yes. Wonder, I think that that's me. I think Clive. Yeah. Oh yes. Know. Oh hi, Clive. I don't know why it's recognizing my 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 uh, machine and not my name. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please, Clive. Go ahead. And then there's a question in, in Spanish, I think, which we'll leave for later. Please, Clive. Go okay. ahead. Hi. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. Uh, I found this a uh, very, really fascinating, and of course, reminded me a lot of my own experiences back in the 1980s as a student. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, my impression of, of a lot of this kind of material that was circulating in our universities, especially, is that that actually, <laughs> I don't know, perhaps I'm being a bit harsh, but my sense was that a lot of these kind of Marxist um, revolutionaries who saw themselves as Marxist revolutionaries were actually, I think, much more, weren't that particularly interested in the complexities of the cases in Latin America itself, but rather were trying to tap into a kind of a romantic revolutionary spirit that they were feeling was coming from Latin America. And most of it, I think, was about, I mean, as you, as you point out, I think a lot of it was about how we can learn lessons from this for our own struggle. Um, and um, I don't know, perhaps Ilrig was, something of, a, of, a, of, a, of an outlier here, but my impression was that there was never really any particular interest in the subtleties of the Latin American cases. Um, but I wanted to just uh, ask a question, uh, and that is that if you had to, if, I, if there was one thing that would have immediately jumped to mind in thinking about links between Latin America and South Africa, I would have thought radical theology. Um, I know you mentioned it right at the beginning, but it, it did strike me as something very powerful. I mean, a lot of these, yes. the Christian lefties here in South Africa yeah. uh, were, and someone like Bishop Tutu himself, 
they had very strong yeah. connections to Latin American radical theology. And I was wondering if that's come into your analysis yeah. or, or your, think, your thinking at all. Yeah. Clive, that is, in Spanish, we have this saying of like, when you have the ink, you know, like old fashioned ink uh, in, in that uh, little bottle. And we will say it's still in my, in my bottle, which means that's a must for me in the future. Uh, unfortunately, my postdoc is not about it, but um, the thing is I found out a lot of information on those networks. Um, and in fact, they were, I think, as you, they probably were much more powerful and, uh, and they had a real impact because students from South Africa were traveling to Latin America with the church. And uh, black students were traveling with the church. And that had a real impact in real life for those students. Uh, and, uh, and the network is so deep and so complex. And, um, and I agree with you. And I have, I have material, but yes, I, I, I had to choose. And that's why I just mentioned it, but I have it for, for the future on how uh, with this theology, they would meet with the, with the Latin American, I don't know if you call them priests in English, you don't call them priests. Uh, if anyone wants to correct that, I don't know. Um, how to translate it? Um, or clergy. The, clergy. Sorry, Kasunde. Uh, clergy, like church people. Yeah. Yes, clergy. Yeah. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Maria. Yes, um, they used to meet uh, in different seminars, and there was a big one taking place in Peru uh, in the seventies, and that's when uh, they managed to kind of like get links that would, uh, how to say, like uh, stay in touch, they will stay in touch in the future. And then uh, I could also see how some clarity from Brazil, because of that meeting in Peru, uh, some clarities from Brazil went to South Africa and uh, some clarities from, so there's like this also moving of people with the church, uh, not only ideas. And uh, I think that made it even more powerful. But, Hopefully one day I will be able to go through it because I, you know, I have the material and I have the links and everything. I even contacted the people this side of the world and even that side of the world, but yeah, you know how it is. Um, but I want to do it because I think that would uh, bring more, uh, more, it will contribute to these discussions. And then, uh, wait, Thanks. yes. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, um, thank you Clive. Uh, we have a couple, I think, more questions in the chat. First one from Emmanuel Paladi. Uh, Maria kindly translated it for me. Uh, How was the political environment in Bolivia after the presidency of uh, Guido Calderon? And uh, Emmanuel, I'm going to be very honest. I cannot answer that. I'm not a specialist um, to go into the details of that. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to get rid now, <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know. Uh, we can look it up. And uh, if we get in touch later on, I can, I can, I can do some research and, and, and answer that properly with time. Um, but right now, I don't know. Thanks. Um, another question from Natalia. Uh, Laura, I have a small doubt. Did you find references to this circulation of ideas? Yes connected to institutions like UWC or Athlon College. Yes. Athlon so College. there were organizations in, uh, in Western Cape University. They also have their own booklets and uh, in Athlon College as well. And in fact, the, I, go to, I go to this theme because in the beginning I was doing research on, uh, on the Teachers League of South Africa. And the Teachers League of South Africa, which was uh, at that time called like a colored teachers uh, movement, um, even in the 40s and 50s, was uh, teaching Latin American uh, history and uh, literature in the, in the so-called uh, so colored schools uh, in, in Athlon, for example. So the, if you trace it, like the, the link with Latin America or the, the, the concern about Latin American uh, ideas among these teachers goes much more beyond time. Uh, it's, and I think that that's a, something else to research someday. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, we're, we've passed 2 p.m. Um, 
Laura, would you, unless there are pressing questions, uh, maybe you can just reflect on some other things mm. you want to <laughs> uh, talk to us about? Um, I, closing remarks. Yeah, I think that when I, when I began this research, I tried to do something that felt meaningful for me also as an Argentine person doing research and specializing myself in African history. I've been teaching African history in Argentina and I've decided to do my PhD in South Africa as a way to also be on the other side. And uh, although South Africa is not everything, but it's, it was one experience. And um, in that sense, um, I, I feel that the research was also motivated by my own personal idea of promoting the links. Because me being in South Africa was a way for me to also promote links nowadays by engaging with students, by engaging with the with movements there, by, by bringing information home. And so at some point, I feel that there's like all this, like past and present are always entangled. Eh? And uh, at least I wanted to mention it because many times we do research on things that we feel that they are meaningful, but they are not, uh, they don't uh, impact on our personal lives. And in this case, it was like that, and it was meant to be like that. Uh, it's kind of like even a political, my political uh, position to, to promote these links and to, to make them visible. So yeah, uh, thank you very much. I think there's a lot to be done and uh, this is just one step. Uh, it was just an, an experience, um, but I do know that there's more to, to be said and to discuss and hopefully people will begin to talk about their experiences and things that they were reading more oftenly in public nowadays. Thank you so much, everyone, for inviting me and for listening and, and everything. Yes. Thank you, uh, Dr. Efren. Uh, really fascinating work. And um, I personally learned a lot and will probably look forward to more of your work. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming and participating. Um, the next workshop is in a couple of weeks. Look at your email for, uh, for, for a notification. Um, so the, the seminar is the next seminar. The seminar is over now and uh, yeah, have a great day.